Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Seat Talk. My name is Lane, and I'm joined today by a very special guest who is actually 38 weeks pregnant. Believe it or not, she is about to pop. We are being joined today by Gretel Adams of Sunny Meadows Flower Farm. Welcome, Gretel. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. We're so excited. And today we're going to talk about the top five Mother's Day flowers on Gretel's farm. And since we have so much to cover, we're actually going to split this conversation into two episodes. So today in part one, we're going to talk about the importance of the Mother's Day holiday to Gretel's farm, as well as two of her farm's top five Mother's Day crops. And we'll finish up with the remaining three next week. And this topic seems very fitting because she's about to give birth. And I should also mention that we are filming this in late February in anticipation of this baby coming, even though it will be airing later. So (laughs) this podcast is sponsored by the Gardener's Workshop. So if you have a need for any seeds, tools, supplies, or online courses, feel free to hop on over to thegardenersworkshop.com and check it out. So are you ready to get started, Gretel? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. So could you start by just telling us a little about yourself and your farm, kind of how long you've been doing it, how big your operation is? Yeah. So um, my husband, Steve, and I have Sunny Meadows Flower Farm. We're in Columbus, Ohio, which is zone 6A. You know, it started out just the two of us kind of on a quarter acre and has grown every year. Um, But when we started, we had pigs, ducks, chickens, we homesteaded, like we grew vegetables, we did a little bit of everything. Um, And through that, through those years, the flowers have become our niche. So we are heading into now, I think what it will be our 17th season, which oh my gosh, but it's been that long. So um, because we started in 2006. And we've been 100% flowers since about year five, year five or year seven, something like that. Um, but the business has really grown over the years. Um, so now in during the season, we have about 25 employees. And in the winter, we go down to about half of that because um, we have H2A workers that go home for the winter time. But yeah, we have 17 greenhouses, half of which are heated. So, you know, some of the things that we're going to talk about today are in heated structures and some of them are in unheated. Um, So, you know, it will just be different based on what your like zone is and yeah, what your specific climate is. But for us, we'll, since we're zone 6A, it does require heat to get some of these flowers in time for Mother's Day. But the reason why we're talking about Mother's Day flowers is because of how important that holiday is for us to hit within our season. Um, So we do have some flowers for Easter. We typically have flowers March through Thanksgiving-ish. And then we do Christmas wreaths in December. We don't really have any flowers blooming January, February. So Easter kind of kicks it off, but Mother's Day is the big hurrah. So like for us, it takes until all of the dahlias and the field crops are blooming in September to make the same amount in a week as we do on Mother's Day. So like all of our focus in our heated houses is for Mother's Day flowers. We can always sell everything that we can cut. And so that's what we're here today to share is some of those specific crops that we have and, um, you know, like planting times and stuff like that so that hopefully other people can grow stuff for Mother's Day as well. Yeah. So Mother's Day, is that just your biggest holiday of the entire year then yeah yeah because if you think about in the summer it's like people don't need flowers for like fourth of july or memorial day you know like all of the summer holidays are not flower holidays and you know there was a winter that i worked at a florist in between our seasons and they would say you know not everybody has a valentine but everybody has some kind of motherly figure in their life whether it's yeah sister aunt grandma friend, you know, like whatever, you know, there's usually somebody that you can buy flowers for. So yeah, for them also the flower shop that I worked for, they also experienced that where Mother's Day was the biggest floral holiday for them. So kicks off the season and then, you know, and it's before a lot of outdoor stuff is ready. So, so who are your customers on Mother's Day? Who are you selling your flowers to? 
So we sell to florists is our biggest sales outlet, but we also have a farm stand on the farm. So our retail sales are in the farm stand or we do online sales because we ship flowers. So florists are our biggest one. Um, You know, we used to do, we've cycled through all of the sales outlets. And so that's something else, you know, through the years that has changed. We used to sell to wholesalers. We used to do weddings. We used to do farmer's markets. Um, and then just through the years, these are the, this is kind of what we've settled on this florist as our focus, but there are a lot of retail sales that happen for Mother's Day as well. Mostly farm stand, but online we offer local delivery or shipping. So we kind of do, do both of those as well for retail. Yeah. And can you also talk about the temperatures in your heated and unheated houses? Cause I think sometimes when people hear that it's heated, they're thinking, oh, it's 70 degrees in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mostly our heated houses are kept at about 45 degrees. And so a lot of the flowers are growing low and slow for a majority of the winter time, Um, you know, just kind of like rooting and just staying alive in there. They're not, um, they're not growing that fast. We're not heating them to 75. As far as cost goes, you know, that's something that we're we're not trying to create a tropical like environment in there. And so the timing yeah. we have on our crop planning is based on the greenhouse being at that temperature. So if you were to heat it warmer, then, you know, your crop timing might be a little, it might be faster than what ours is. Um, we're also pretty gray and cloudy in Ohio in the winter. So that's something else to consider if you're somewhere that is sunnier, you know, your crops might be a little bit more accelerated just because they're going to grow faster in a warm greenhouse. So even if it's really cold outside, even if it's 18 degrees outside, but it's full sun, your greenhouse might need opened up because it's still going to be hot in the greenhouse, you know, based on the sun coming in. So some of that, you know, just kind of depends also on your greenhouse management strategies and how well you're like ventilating ventilating things too. So that's a really good point. And I should also mention if you're watching over on YouTube, all the beautiful images you're about to see were provided by Gretel. So thank you for that. So let me go ahead and talk about what we're going to be discussing for each of these top five flowers. So first I'm going to ask Gretel why each crop is so important to their farm for Mother's Day. Then we're going to talk about if there are any particular colors or varieties they like to grow for that particular holiday. We're also going to talk about if they grow that flower in structures, if they grow it in the field and kind of how long they succession plant for. Then we're going to talk about the general overall typical bloom times for each flower and how many stems they expect to get per plant. And then for each flower, we'll pick some sort of growing or harvesting tip that Gretel will share with us. And I should also mention that the two crops we're covering today are things that Gretel grows from corms. Next week, we'll have two seed grown crops and a bulb. So let's go ahead and get started with the very first one, which is going to be anemones. So why are anemones such an important Mother's Day crop for Sunny Meadows? Well, it's something that for us for Mother's Day can be grown in an unheated structure. And so that is like important when some of these other crops that we're going to talk about later require heat. So when we were first starting with greenhouses, with hoop houses, this was the, you know, ranunculus and anemones were the first two things that we would have for Mother's Day time. So they have kind of the same like treatment and timing, but the anemones, I think they kind of get overshadowed by ranunculus time in the spring, um, but they are really beautiful. The unheated ones sometimes will send out like really short ones in the beginning. Um, But for Mother's Day, you can also, we have a product that we call Little Hotties, which are just like in a four inch vase, just like a little, which absorbs all the like short flowers. But, you know, a lot of people want something that kind of is just like a small giftable size that's in a vase that they don't have to like deal with arranging themselves or whatever. And that kind of helps absorb um, any, if there's short anemones, tulips or ranunculus, but yeah, what we what I love about anemones is, is the way they kind of open and close. Um, oh, I love night. that. 
So like, you know, if it is a sunny day, you're going to go out and they're all going to be fully blown open. But if it's cloudy, then they're going to stay kind of closed or when they go in the cooler, they close. So I like the way that they, yeah, that they change kind of throughout their life cycle too. I love that. I absolutely love anemones. And it is a good thing to note, like you said, it's really valuable when you can grow something in an unheated space versus heated because the heated is kind of your most valuable real estate on the farm, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so by having these be unheated, that gives you the space in the heated and allows you to kind of like grow more volume for that time of year. Yeah. So are there any specific colors or varieties you like to grow for Mother's Day or do your florists and customers like everything? (laughs) Yeah. So the panda anemones are always the most popular for us. Those are the white with the black centers. Oh. Um, and then also sort of like blushy pastel colors. I love the dark ones, but what we found for Mother's Day is that not all, I think not all people who are buying for moms think that they're going to want dark flowers is actually what yeah. it is. Like, I think that there's moms out yeah. there also love dark flowers but um I would say white and kind of the blushy lavendery tone so if you're watching this on YouTube you know the the ones in the photo you can see are kind of lavendery blush color there's um, a few different varieties there's one called um caramel pastel which is sort of a mix of like lavenders and blush tones or whatever and those ones we really like and then there's also one called mistral rarity that is it kind of reminds me of a magnolia blossom where it's like when it's closed it's like purpley um like lavender on the outside and then when it opens it's sort of like blushy on the inside um and those are some of my favorites just because they are all a little bit different purple is another like one that we always grow we don't grow a ton of red, but that was also might just be based on our market. Like our florists yeah. don't like a lot of red in the spring. Um, so, but I know, you know, for some people who sell to like grocery stores or, you know, just have other sales outlets that red, red might be a color that works for you, but we stick kind of with a lot of the pastel blushy tones mostly. All right. So can you talk about when you start planting anemones and kind of how long you're planting for or how many successions you do? Yeah. So anemones, we don't plant as many successions because they sort of behave differently than ranunculus in that once they're established, they'll just keep giving you stems until it gets too hot and then they shut down. So what's different from them is is ranunculus might give you five or six stems per plant, but anemones are going to, once they're established, just sort of produce until it's too hot. So we only plant three successions of anemones. Um, The first succession goes in the heated space. So that's actually what's blooming now. This is the end of February. We typically are shooting for beginning of March, but it's been really nice. So that everything's a little bit early this year. The ones that like we plant for Mother's Day are typically like a week 51 start, you know, somewhere end of December ish is when they get started in the unheated space for Mother's Day bloom. Perfect. And then how long is your anemone season? Like when do they start blooming and when do they peter out? Well, with the heated space, they start blooming now end of February. Um, With the unheated space, I think it would be more like mid-March. And then they go until end of May-ish for us. It just kind of depends on how hot it gets, how fast in the spring. So if we end up having multiple 90-degree days in May, then they're going to shut down faster. So the goal is to have them through the end of May. But um sometimes if it's a cool spring you get an extra like bonus week or two and sometimes if it's hot it might be more like right after mother's day they shut down so just sort of depends on what's happening have you ever had any issues hitting mother's day with your anemones or are they pretty consistent you've always been able to have them for that holiday they're pretty consistent as far as like because they usually are starting by at least the beginning of april um and Yeah. Even if it is a hot spring, 
Mother's Day might be the last harvest you get out of them, but they yeah. they still usually make it for us through Mother's Day. <laughs> okay, good. And yeah. you said they just kind of keep producing, so it may be a little too hard to estimate the number of stems. Do you have any idea about that? Um, I would say they would probably give you like eight to 10 stems per plant over the life cycle. If you get them started earlier, like for the ones for us that are in the heated space, we might even get more stems out of them than that since they're in the ground for longer. But I would say on average, maybe eight or so. Great. And then could you give us a tip perhaps on how to know when to harvest an anemone? Yeah. So like we were talking about earlier, they open and close at night. So you, they say you want to have them after they've opened like three days. So the way that you know is the petals start to get larger and they start to move away from the collar. So the foliage collar. So if you're watching this, there is one in the center, um, that purple one, how it's kind of moved away from, moved away from that foliage. So some varieties move away a little bit more than others. The pandas stay a little bit more condensed, but there still is that space in between. So if you cut them too tight, then they're never going to open in the same way. Like they'll open, but the petals are going to stay pretty small. So we want to try and let them open up a, a couple times before you pick them, just so you get the maximum like petal length. And if you ever see them super stretched out or they're starting to shed pollen, like that's when they're too old um, and they're not going to last very long. So sometimes you get those ones that got missed and they're like these big, huge, amazing yeah. ones that are going to last for a couple of days. Yeah. But um, yeah, so you want to get them sort of in that middle ground when the petals are nice and developed, but before they start to shed any pollen. Perfect. And is there anything else you want to share about anemones before we move on? I mean, just that you, if you have unheated space, you should grow them. Yeah. Okay, good. Good tip. Yeah. Now we're moving on to ranunculus, another one that's grown from corms. Why are ranunculus such an important Mother's Day crop for your farm? Well, I think ranunculus are something that people know by name, for sure. It's definitely popular. They're always hungry for ranunculus in the spring. I, I think people would love to have ranunculus year round if they could, but, um, yes. you know, they do <laughs> shut down, they shut down in the heat. So, um, yeah, so we grow both the butterfly ranunculus and the standard ranunculus. I think that the standard ranunculus is definitely what folks know more. The butterfly is gaining in popularity and they understand, but it's sort of, looks different than what the ranunculus that they're used to and usually is a little bit more expensive since the corms are more expensive. So the regular ranunculus is what we definitely grow the most of and sell the most of for Mother's Day. And if you're watching over on YouTube, on the left is an example of butterfly ranunculus and on the right is regular. And what are some of the differences between butterfly and regular, aside from the fact that the flower looks a bit different? Um, the butterfly also require more space, so you can't plant as many plants per bed, which the first year we grew them, we didn't realize that and then needed to like give them all the space in the greenhouse that we didn't really have. So, <laughs> so just know that they, they're more branchy and that they require, they're more bushy and they require more space. But as far as timing goes, they are pretty much the same timing. Sometimes the butterfly is even a little bit faster than the regular ranunculus. And yeah, I think they give you about the same number of stems though, as far as production goes. All right. And what colors and varieties do you find to be the most popular for Mother's Day? So white and salmon are definitely the biggest, biggest hits. We also anything that kind of in that blushy pastel range, pinks, but we also do sell a lot of orange, orange and yellow, just something bright and cheery. Yeah. But white is definitely the biggest one. Uh, also just because it kind of heads into wedding season for us too. But we do like, I, you know, we kind of start out the season with our ranunculus with like the white blush salmon and like light, like pink and all of that. So like, it's sort of nice for Mother's Day is like when we add in all the other colors, orange, yellow, hot pink, and have some of those like purpley lavender ones and just yeah. have like more variety. So it's always fun 
for me once the other colors start coming in and it's not just like wedding colors happening all the time yeah. so we we like a lot of the different varieties when it comes to mother's day options yes so can you talk about when you start planting ranunculus and kind of how long you're planting for and i know you have quite a complex succession and planting schedule with unheated mm-hmm. heated so yeah can you share some of that with us Yeah, so we start planting ranunculus on the farm in October and we go through beginning of March is the last time we plant it. So we're definitely, we're planting a lot of ranunculus a lot of different times and spreading it out between heated and unheated. So for Mother's Day, we have both heated and unheated that bloom. We try to have the heated ones be some of the more specialty varieties like Hanoi's or the butterflies typically are grown in heat for Mother's Day um, or any of the like romance series that are like the more any of the forms that it cost more are coming from the heat for Mother's Day. And that's because they are getting the most attention to detail and the best like care to get them in time. And the unheated ones that are typically, I think week 50 is that um, start date for, and that's any of like the standard ranunculus can handle being unheated. I think you can grow some of those specialty ones, not in the heat, but because we're spending so much on those corms, we just want to make sure that they're, yeah, getting the best care that they can. Top priority. Yeah. (laughs) So what is your typical blooming time frame for ranunculus? So ranunculus is kind of similar to the anemones as far as the season goes. So for us, it's March through Mother's Day. So same situation with the anemones where the heat is going to shut them down. So this last planting that we do in March is kind of like a Hail Mary planting where it's like it may or may not bloom. It just kind of depends on the season. It might bloom really short if it gets hot, but it still is nice to sort of have that for like end of May wedding season-ish. So, but yeah, Mother's Day is the goal. These ones are Bianco Striato. Different companies sell them as different things. So if you're ordering from Awnings, they're called Bianco Striato. If you're ordering labels I think they're called white picketty they used to be called cappuccino which I don't really know why they were <laughs> called that but so there's multiple different like terms for them but these ones are a nice one for mother's day just I mean because they're frilly and they're kind of pink but I like the way they look like tiger striped oh they do they do so you kind of already touched on this but how many stems do you expect to get off of a ranunculus plant Typically about five stems per plant. All right. And can you also describe the proper harvest stage for ranunculus? Um, Yeah. So we want to get them before they're fully blown open. So this picture is actually a good example of like some of them are starting to get really loose. So kind of like a fluffy marshmallow stage is what we're hoping for. Like something that is they're still closed, but the petals are starting to loosen a little bit. And that's another thing that's going to depend on sales outlet and how long you're trying to like hold them. So, you know, if we're harvesting on Friday and we're not selling it until Monday or Tuesday or whatever, it's like, we want to pick that a little bit tighter so it can stay in the cooler. If you're harvesting on Friday and you're selling at a Saturday market, then, you know, they can be more open, but you still want to make sure the petals aren't so loose that they're not like dropping petals you can feel like you can feel the difference when you squeeze it um as far as like how much it's it it gives so it's kind of like a peony where you can kind of do it by feel Mm -hmm. yep and then you'll get used to it as you go and you won't have to squeeze them all but in the beginning you know really giving them that that squeeze test helps especially because some of them have more layers of petals than others so like the tecolote varieties um some of those are more singly and so they're going to feel different when they're starting to open than others as far as the number of layers of petals that there are um so there are sometimes you know the goal is with the greenhouse flowers not to have any get too old but there is sometimes where if it's real sunny over a weekend or whatever some of them might get too blown out for sale by the time that it comes you know to the next yeah week. 
All right, everyone, that was the first half of our episode with Gretel. Hope you enjoyed all that information about growing anemones and ranunculus. Join us again next week for the remaining three crops in Gretel's top five most important flowers for Mother's Day. You can check out Sunny Meadows Flower Farm on Instagram or sunnymeadowsflowerfarm.com if you want to learn more about Steve and Gretel's farm. They also have an online course with the Gardener's Workshop called Growing Cut Flower Crops in Hoop and Greenhouses. That course opens for enrollment in the fall, but you can get on their email list now to be notified when that opens for registration. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone, and see you next week. Happy growing!